Today's episode is sponsored by Airflow Breast Pumps. Did you know that your health insurance will cover the cost of a breast pump? It is true, guys. I promise. In fact, many health insurance plans also cover milk storage bags, breastfeeding prep courses, and more. At Airflow Breast Pumps, you can shop top-rated breast pumps from brands like Medela, Spectra, and Motif without ever opening your wallet. Fill out their quick and easy insurance eligibility form, and they'll take care of the rest. It might just be the easiest thing that you do during your whole pregnancy. Just visit airflowbreastpumps.com slash mommy labor nurse. That's A-E-R-O-F-L-O-W breastpumps.com slash mommy labor nurse to find out why more than 1 million moms have chosen Airflow Breast Pumps to get their pump through insurance. You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, where you'll gain the tools, knowledge, and confidence you need to erase the unknowns, feel in control, and have an even better birth, no matter how you deliver. My name is Liesl Teen, mom of two, practicing labor and delivery nurse, and your host. From over eight years and counting of working at the bedside, I know that knowledge is the key to an even better birth. So tune in each week to learn about all things pregnancy, birth, and postpartum from me, a labor and delivery nurse that's seen it all. And now let's get into this week's episode. Welcome back to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. Today, I have a really interesting episode that focuses on the connection between birth interventions and breastfeeding success. I'm honored to have Dr. Robin Thompson join me, an experienced midwife, maternal child and family health nurse, breastfeeding specialist, and founder of the Thompson Method Breastfeeding Program. During her 45 years as a hospital and home birth midwife, she observed that many women were being discharged from the hospital with painful breastfeeding complications, while those who gave birth at home were breastfeeding successfully. Passionately inquisitive by nature, of course, she made it her mission to discover what was causing this disparity. Seven years and a PhD later, Her research clearly showed that the practice of rushing women through the system and forcing babies to the breast increased the risk of painful nipple trauma. This groundbreaking knowledge formed the foundation for the Thompson Method Breastfeeding Program and the Thompson Method Breastfeeding Academy. I am so excited to share Dr. Robin's valuable perspective and insights with you guys today, particularly if you are an expecting mama listening that is hoping to breastfeed. Lastly, before we get into it, I do want to let you know that after this episode, you can gain more breastfeeding knowledge too inside of episode 145, Preparing to Breastfeed with IBCLC, Erica Campbell. But now let's listen to my incredible interview with Dr. Robin Thompson. Hi, Dr. Robin. Thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. Pleasure, Liesl. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm so excited to chat today. Can you start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what you do, your background, anything you want to share? Okay. I'm a mother, big wife, grandmother. Yeah. Uh, and a grandmother of uh, boys in their one's 30, one's 28. I was their midwife. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, Yeah, and I have been a midwife now. I've been in the Australian health system for 62 years um, since nursing, but I've been a midwife for 50 years, and my journey has been one of going with the flow. Sounds great. Yeah, and you've got this really great method called the Thompson Method. So can you just give our listeners, if they have no idea what the Thompson Method is, give our listeners just like a little brief on what that is. Well, it's based on gentle breastfeeding and I'd never, ever dreamt that it would be called the Thompson Method, but my my professors engaged in encouraging me to do that. Yeah. (laughs) So I continued with that flow as well and now it is the Thompson Method, which I'm very proud of and I have an amazing team who organise me now, which, you know, is 
half the battle really when you're yeah. helping yeah. Men around the world to be able to use the technology and to be able to set things up and to be able to solve problems if they occur, especially with the internet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a magic team and I now have a an academy which is headed by Rachel Austin. She's a midwife colleague of mine of many years and she chose education as her journey and so she's heading up the academy and uh, it's going well at the moment, so we're happy about that. Yeah, very cool, very cool. So when you say gentle breastfeeding, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, gentle breastfeeding starts with, uh, for me, starts with the transition of pregnancy, a mother's Mm -hmm. pregnancy, it's her pregnancy, her labour, her birth, and if she chooses breastfeeding her baby. And in the case of healthy babies, healthy mothers, babies up gas score of seven or more, no one touches, the baby Mm -hmm. comes to the mother. It belongs to the mother and the more we bring babies to their mothers, the more that the whole environment for the mother and the baby settle, you know, Mm. it becomes calm and uh, we watch the baby's behaviour and we watch the baby's colour but we just don't touch and uh, and we don't do procedures that are routine procedures. We might Mm. have to do things that are, you know, if an APGAR score is less than seven, we might need to help the baby or if there's something with the mother we might need to help her but we other than that we don't touch her and I believe that she should have her baby with her for the first 72 hours Mm -hmm. and nobody touches her baby unless she asks for it. Yes simple enough I think right (laughs) that's great well I want to talk about interventions a little bit like inductions c-sections and how they affect breastfeeding rates so Specifically, what do you think hospitals and birth teams really can do to mitigate the impact that these certain interventions might have on breastfeeding rates? Well, think about the rates of interventions that are happening around the world at the moment and reduce those interventions because women are very capable of giving birth to their babies if they have a known midwife. If they have a midwife by their side, then they can give birth. And, you know, it does take time. Every woman is unique. Every baby is unique. Every part of every person is unique. So, you know, there's no two people on the planet that are exactly the same. We're Mm -hmm. all unique genetically, biophysiologically, anatomically, neurologically, psychologically and emotionally. And we expect women to do things that professionals, particularly now in this era, expect women to do what they want them to do or they policy says, their policy says, well, policy in this country anyway is not legal. So, Mm -hmm. you know, a woman has a right to do her journey in the way she chooses and having home birthed for 25 years, I learned so much about that about what women were capable of, in, particularly when they weren't in foreign places to give birth to their babies. They were yeah. in their own place where it was quiet and calm and they progressed beautifully and progress is the key word. Yeah, progress is definitely the key word, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's been my um, amazing journey. I've been in charge of a labour ward as well for quite some years and charge of a hospital and, you know, I learned all of those things along the way. But I think I did most of my learning with women in their own home because they Mm. were teaching me things that I didn't need to do because they were very capable. But I was there if they needed something and I was there Mm. on the alert if things didn't go right. But I never, ever, ever had to transfer around a 1,000 women, never had to transfer anyone by ambulance and it was a 2% transfer rate. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty low. And that's, yeah, that's definitely something to be proud of. A, a, no, I think you know, we need to stop the unnecessary intervention, step yeah. back, stop rupturing membranes, because when you do that, you change the hydraulic pressure that helps, that assists the labor, assists the uterus, mm. assists the baby. And it's there for drinking. Every time the baby drinks, the baby gets the hiccups. Mm. So we need to stop all of those things where we invade women's bodies. Mm-hmm unnecessarily. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, unnecessarily, of course. That's the key word here. Yeah. Not sure what you need to care for yourself down there after birth. I've been there. (laughs) Not stocking up on postpartum essentials before I gave birth to my first was one of my biggest mistakes. I don't know what I was thinking, guys. (laughs) 
But now as a two-time mama, I know a thing or two about postpartum recovery and exactly what you need to make it through this stage as comfortably as possible. For a completely free checklist of what you need to stock up on for those early postpartum days, just head over to mommylabornurse.com slash postpartum checklist. That's mommylabornurse.com slash postpartum checklist, all one word, to grab the PDF for free today. Well, with all of this in mind, let's talk about like birth plans. So what would you say are some of the most important things when we're thinking about breastfeeding that moms should indicate on their birth plans to set themselves up for breastfeeding, not just like postpartum stuff, you know, like, hey, don't come in my room, blah, blah, blah. But even we're talking about labor and things during labor. What would you say some of the most important things? Well, I think the opioids is one of the biggest problems for the baby Mm -hmm. for breastfeeding because opioids do create the sleepy baby syndrome. Mm -hmm. And we see that, I see it all the time because I'm online with women with live breastfeeds, you know, and all Mm -hmm. around the world again. And you see the babies struggling to feed because their coordination is affected by the opioids. And of course, the mother's affected by it too. And it takes time for it to bind and process through the through the liver and break down. Mm -hmm. So we need to consider the use of opioids. Um, I encourage women to consider sterile water injections, which create pain-free, you know, if they really are needing something. And uh, again, it all depends on the unique circumstances at the time, but certainly avoid opioids. And then the baby, the other important thing is not to touch, as I've said before, and then Mm -hmm. the baby will with the mother in its own good time and in my experience at home births about half an hour to an hour gradually start to find its way to the breast Mm -hmm. and then it feeds and then that's the start of when if no one touches the baby no one's you know interfering with the baby or the mother's breast things can generally come together quite well and and if they have been on my program and looked at the symmetrical face-to-breast contact Mm -hmm. and the tuning that I suggest that is unique for every woman. It's not the same for every woman, but it's similar. So I don't have any rules, no mathematics, no rules, because if you apply rules, then you create problems for the mother. And, of course, here we have early discharge, so the woman's sent home, and before you know it, she's in pain. She's distressed because too many people are involved in her. what's her journey and her birth. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, you've mentioned hands off a whole lot. So are there any specific breastfeeding practices that we as healthcare providers, I know you've said hands off, but maybe there's like specific things that you think we should do as healthcare providers or hospitals that we can implement to kind of support this hands off method? Yes, I would say Well, you know, I've studied the craniocervical spine and the oral cavity and all the connections, Mm -hmm. the the tongue muscle function, the oral function, uh, how milk production is generated by the baby. It's not by drugs and things that that Mm -hmm. women take. It's by the endocrine system and the pituitary gland. So I go through all of that with the women in as much as I can in pregnancy so that they have understanding. But most important for me is not to touch the baby's craniocervical spine, Mm. not to hold the baby by the base of the skull where the small brain is housed behind the occipital bone, not to touch the baby's neck where the baby rotates and turns and does what we need to do with our head and our neck because the nuchal ligament looks after our neck. It supports our neck all the way down to the seventh cervical vertebrae. So the baby can drop its little head and move itself to the breast as it needs to. Some go faster than others. (laughs) It all depends. It's absolutely beautiful watching them. And not to touch the mother's breast or try to reshape it or try to push the baby on because the baby's oral cavity drawing function doesn't work when you shove a baby to the breast or you push Mm -hmm. a baby to the breast because they can't coordinate. Mm -hmm. And the analogy I use, it's like someone holding me by the back of the head and then shoving me up to my plate with a big piece of steak on it. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I can't use my oral cavity. So I've watched this for many, many years now and, uh, It's the common reason, one of the most common reasons why women have nipple trauma to start with. Interesting. So that's because the vacuum system can't function and the baby then ends up using the anterior tongue 
to compress the nipple into the area behind the upper gum, which is in a corrugated area, and mm-hmm. it's damaged there with the pressure of the anterior tongue and the jaw trying to function. Mm-hmm. So when we take a little step back, we know that the lips seal the breast. They create the beginning of the vacuum. The tongue extends when the chin's in the breast, de- indenting in the breast, because mm-hmm. under there, under the tongue, from the middle of the back of the tongue to the chin, the back of the chin is the genioglossus muscle which lengthens the tongue. So if the chin's forward, the nostrils are on the breast and the cheeks are against the breast, then the baby has the potential to use its full oral cavity function. It Mm. might need some fine-tuning with the mother, but that's unique to every mother. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. So, so the baby, I never touch her baby ever because I can't. We're across the seas a lot of the time or we're across the country. Yeah, you're totally right. So, okay, this is what I've always been taught when I'm helping my mom's first breastfeed is like you take the baby and you hold the breast and then, you know, you do a cross cradle or you do a football. So when you say hands off, like I'm imagining baby's just born, right? So you're saying just leave baby alone, let mom lay on their back or on their side or like even guide a mom. I'm asking you, I guess, as a nurse, <laughs> like what do I what do I tell my patients? Okay, so it depends on her circumstances. Obviously, yeah. if she's had major abdominal surgery, yeah. she has to be comfortable and that's you make her as comfortable as you can. But it's generally putting the left arm round for the left breast gently uh-huh. and the right arm for the right breast with your elbows by the side so that the upper arm is not interfering with the baby's head and the baby sits naturally on the mother's anatomical arm Ah. lies on the arm across her body and so if it's lying across her body it doesn't have to be straight across but most often it's easier for the mother when she's first starting to have her baby across her body sometimes as they get older the bottom sits on the knee you know and then Mm -hmm. they can angle because the breast is a circle so it's working around that area where the baby does the work where the baby actually comes lips over nipple starts the vacuum process draws the nipple along the middle of the tongue to the soft palatal cleft and then the nipple's protected it's not moving in and out of the soft palatal cleft and it, then the pressure rises as it draws that's normal because the vacuum pressures up and then when the baby has finished stimulating then a milk flow comes and you see the baby draw swallow draw swallow breathe draw swallow breathe and you see that rhythm happening and that's when you know if there's no pain the nipples in the soft palatal cleft because it's a circle it's Mm -hmm. a soft circle back there and uh, it rises so it doesn't actually compress the nipple Mm -hmm. someone with trauma might be feeling pain on drawing Pain on drawing is because there's damaged tissues and they stretch as the vacuum increases. But once the baby starts to swallow, most women will say, oh, that feels better. Mm. So, again, if they're well fine-tuned according to their unique body shape, their unique breast, their unique nipple, then, you know, that seems to be, well, that's been what's happened with me and that's how I came to do the research because I never intended to do it. (laughs) (laughs) One of those roll along things that happened in my life. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Well, that is so interesting. Okay. Let's talk about misconceptions maybe or myths about breastfeeding immediately after birth. Do you have any common ones that you see? Yeah. They're things where professionals need to review their practice. (laughs) Yeah. It sounds like it. (laughs) But also, and make, you know, focus on the mother because that's a duty of care. Yeah. When you follow your duty of care and you have someone to look after, you can't look after 10 people, you know, and that does happen. Lots of midwives and professionals are under enormous institutional pressure. So the focus is on that mother and that baby at the time and making sure all of the things we've just talked about are happening, that she's comfortable. But a baby doesn't feed continuously for two hours or three Mm -hmm. hours. It actually doesn't go to the breast straight away. It's actually smelling, tasting, connecting with the mother and her beautiful body externally now and knowing that it's her, then that's, you know, how the baby settles. Then the baby makes its way to the breast and then it feeds leisurely for, 
you know, a period of time till it brings down the colostrum. Mm -hmm. And then most times in my home birth information, education, sharing with women, when I was watching, the babies would go to sleep, they'd wake up something like six hours later and then they'd feed frequently Mm. up to about 72 hours changing breasts during that time. Then the milk volume peaks and once the milk volume is coming in, we change to two-sided feeding. So the baby feeds to gastric satisfaction on one breast, Mm -hmm. rest and digest, then feeds to gastric satisfaction on the second breast then rest and digest, and then held in arms until it settles. And then, you know, that seems to be the picture that we're fortunate enough to see. And it was very clear in my research that the 85% of women were taught to hold their baby and force it to the breast or push it to the breast. Right. And 79% had nipple trauma and there was... I can't remember the two, but there was breast engorgement and mastitis because the first breastfeed was interrupted or the baby Mm. was separated. And so that didn't start the process of the milk production happening when a newborn, you know, feeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. We're we're systemized, remember. We're all, Mm -hmm. and me too, we've all come through systemization. And we apply systemization and the requirements of systemization and we're told what to do when we're professionals in our own right. And right. this is very difficult when you're providing care that's um, a duty of care for one-on-one at the moment that you're looking after someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. We have a lot of pressure on us in the system. Um, yeah. you know, time poor, all those things are very difficult and I think it's time that we all started to realise and maybe put ourselves in that position ourselves and think how we'd like to be looked after. All right, the sound of that heartbeat means it's time for this week's segment of Birth It Up Babies. This one says, my husband and I purchased your natural series course, and man, it was everything to us. Aw, we went into our little one's birth with so much knowledge and advocacy. I was able to hand my birth plan over to the nurse who was insanely impressed. I kept saying, be like Raggedy Ann when I was going through contractions. That's awesome. Also, back labor is no joke. Yikes. Yes, no joke. (laughs) I'm so damn proud to say that we had our little man with no medication or interventions. Didn't even have an IV started. I felt like a damn rock star. And I know I have your course to thank. Oh, I love it. Oh, I can just feel her feeling like through her words. Oh, love it. My water broke at 7 p.m. Sunday night and he was born at 5.50 Monday morning. I pushed for 12 minutes and was told by my mid wife that I was a damn hero. (laughs) The third time she said damn. See, she's pumped. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for everything you do for expecting mothers and their families. It does not go unnoticed. I love it. Thank you so much. When you guys send me these messages, I just, I love them. If you want to have an even better birth, just like this mama, head on over to mommylabornurse.com slash courses to learn more about our three online on-demand birth classes. What about some advice for someone who maybe their baby was taken from them for medical reasons after birth? Well, at Gusk or Lesson 7 is highly likely a baby will be moved, but we're actually working on having the baby beside the mother uh-huh. uh, so that the there's a, a setup now that's been devised that can be well, the mother can see, touch if necessary, reassure the baby. But it just depends what needs doing and how long the baby's there and what, you know, how the baby's able to feed or not to feed when it is finished with or when the the stranger people are finished with it, the professionals. Mm -hmm. And then it's important then to mimic or do what the baby would do. So bring down the colostrum with help if necessary, but gentle help, not the bruised breasts that I have seen. And very gentle rhythm, draw, swallow with your stimulation or the mother's stimulation if she's able. Again, she may not be able to, so helping her and then giving the colostrum to the baby to make sure the microbiomes are preparing the gut from the get-go. And then have a little break for a while, let her rest 
and then see how things are going. And then if the baby's not ready to come back to her because it's gone to the nursery, Mm -hmm. uh, then it's very important that either she can connect with her baby and talk with it and touch it, or if she can't do that because things are too difficult, then to start expressing her breasts over a period of time for a while or someone helping her, then stopping and having a break and then doing it again until the breast milk starts to peak Mm -hmm. and the baby's having her milk all Mm -hmm. the way through and fed to the baby as gently as possible, not in volumetric amounts where the baby's really overwhelmed by the volume. Watch the baby's cues Mm -hmm. and the baby gives you all the information. Again, it's about replicating as much as possible what would be done under normal circumstances when the mm-hmm. mother and baby are closely united and doing what they need to do. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. No, I like how it's. it feels like you're simplifying things and that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Coming back to basics, isn't it, Lisa? It's coming back to yeah. the basics of survival. Yeah. It's all about survival and, you know, we don't see the other mammals shoving or pushing babies to the breast. We don't see Absolutely. other mammals. You know, that the mother does her best to feed her babies all the time and she might have multiples in some cases, mm-hmm. you know, multiple multiples. <laughs> so I sort of try and think it through in a way that what's best for that mother and what's best for that particular baby as well because, you know, as you said, the circumstances, as we know, the circumstances change for many and particularly in this era where Mm -hmm. there's so much intervention. One intervention leads to cascading intervention Mm -hmm. and, you know, we do have complications arising and sometimes we're rushing as well so Mm -hmm. that doesn't help either and we're wanting this woman to give birth to her baby much faster than what she would do normally. For sure. Well, can we talk a little bit about how important I would say the role of lactation support is in those not just first few hours after birth, but like those first few days, those first few weeks and how that impacts breastfeeding success rates? Well, I can confidently say I have women in my practice now who are feeding me back. They're feeding to two years, Uh some to three years, but they're feeding much longer. And their feedback, they give the feedback, right? So the feedback is that they have been really enjoying and satisfied that beautiful time with their baby because it goes so quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying everybody does that, but, you know, certainly the time is longer. Some women, when they go back to work, which is sad, I would pay every woman a wage to stay home with her. (laughs) <laughs> if I was in the political arena, I'd focus on that and not interfering in our practices. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I think we have to rethink the whole thing about what we're doing for mothers and future generations of children and young people and adults, you know, how we're affecting them in this very early time when the mother's united with her baby. But if she has to go back to work, they often contact me and we talk about what's best for them and their family life and Mm -hmm. how they can achieve that. We don't have rules. What about partners? What about like maybe the role that partners play and the notion of family-centered care during this immediate postpartum period? I love it when the partners are involved. (laughs) I'm sure, yeah. so much difference, (laughs) honestly. And they come online and they talk and they ask questions and they yeah. look at it and they're looking at things that I'm looking at from a distance. They're looking at much closer mm-hmm. and they're picking it up really easily in that early breastfeeding period and as it goes along. Um, they're very interested in the growth and development of the babies. In my group sessions when we do, you know, some sessions with the team I have around different parts of the country here, there's always – The guys are turning up, partners are turning up. Last one in Perth in Australia, we had a lovely male midwife come asking amazing questions. So, so, you know, there's always room for partners and I think it's better that they're there and that they're understanding too because when they're understanding, they become much better advocates for their partner as well. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, and that's a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so I love it. I absolutely love when they're there. And I tell them that too. I tell them how valuable it is that they are there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, amazing. Dr. Robin, can you tell our listeners if they are like, I want to listen to this lady talk way more and I just want to learn everything, you know, I can learn about the Thompson Method. Where can people learn more about you and learn more about the Thompson Method? Well, my team will guide you there. <laughs> but I can say that I do have a program for pregnant women. But yes, I am online. I'm on YouTube. But again, I'm not sure I have a plan. And it's a template for women to look at to see what they would like to do on that template. And they can take what they want from it. It's not set up for every individual woman. It's for each woman to make a selection of what might suit her. And she can talk then with her caregivers she can talk sit down and have a chat with them and the copy of that can go in her medical record and then people begin to understand that women are asking questions and they're making changes and they understand in that template too that if something does not occur in the way it should that if it was a real emergency that the senior medical officer makes the decisions for them Mm -hmm. and has the right legal right to do that So, you know, it has the law of consent and it makes them people more interested in having a look at what the law of consent says, but it has all the things to do with breastfeeding as well. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we will definitely link that template below so people can check that out. Dr. Robin, thank you so much for joining me today. This was fabulous. I have to work at the hospital tomorrow. So I feel like I'm going to go in and be like, okay, Dr. Robin told me, don't, I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to touch you. so. They're making me go all goosey. <laughs> oh, it is beautiful. But look, just go gently, go calmly wow. because it will be a change for you probably too. So you need to be calm and gentle on yourself. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. so, you know, and the more that we share information with women, the more that we are being responsible for them mm-hmm. understanding things that they probably haven't been involved in or, you know, discussed with them before. Mm-hmm. So again, I think sharing information openly is a really good way to go. So I hope you have a wonderful time <laughs> when you go t- tomorrow, is it? Yeah, it is tomorrow. It's at 7 a.m. Have a so. wonderful time. And I look forward to maybe you giving me a little feedback on how you think you are going. I love it. I love it. I yeah. will let you know. Well, Dr. Robin, thank you so much for joining me Absolute today. It was a pleasure. pleasure. Already feeling a little more confident about pregnancy, birth, and newborn life? Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you can continue to erase the unknowns and never miss an episode. And if you're looking for even more, Instagram is definitely where I hang out the most. Come join our community of more than a half a million moms for birth education, tips, and solidarity. You can find me at mommy.labornurse. Check out today's show notes and a searchable library of every Mommy Labor Nurse podcast episode at mommylabornurse.com slash podcast. And while you're there, be sure to head to the blog to learn about our online birth classes too. See you next week. And remember, you can have an even better birth no matter how you deliver.